Hello, this is Russell coming to you from the Tate Geological Museum at Casper College. And today I'm going to talk to you about something that we've been neglecting. I've been focusing a lot on skulls in these uh, talks in the past to the point where some of you might have gotten the misapprehension that the world of the ancient past was a world of disembodied heads floating around. No, these heads were attached to the rest of whole complete living animals and uh, every bit of the body was important in helping them to live, thrive, and survive. And uh, one of those bits is the tail. So we're going to be looking at some tail bones today and uh, see how they were shaped in order to aid the animal in survival. These are the bones of dinosaur tails. This is one of the vertebrae, one of the bones that goes in the tail of a megalosaur. Would have gone right about here. And this is a good example of an unmodified dinosaur tailbone. This is kind of the standard issue basic uh, design. So we've got this part here, that's the centrum, the middle part of the tailbone. Coming up on either side here, we've got a pair of transverse processes, and then the neural spine coming up here. Then uh, this is the neural canal, that's where the spinal cord would go through each bone. And then uh, these bits here, and here are called the zygopophyses. The ones in front are called the prezygopophyses, and the ones in the back are called the postzygopophyses. But none of that'll be on the test. Now, uh, these pr transverse processes are anchoring points for a variety of muscles, uh, one of which are the intertransversarii. And when those muscles on one side contract, it flexes the tail to that side. And if they contract on the other side, they flex it the other way. And if waves of a muscle contraction go from the base of the animal's tail to the end of it, and if those waves are staggered, then that'll cause the whole tail to move in a sinuous S-curve kind of motion. And this is very useful if you're going to be swimming because that's how most reptiles swim, is by undulating uh, the tail like that. And early primitive dinosaurs and certain uh, primitive dinosaurs, even in the Cretaceous, were able to swim quite well by using the tail uh, in that way. And this megalosaur exemplifies that uh, primitive, unmodified dinosaur tailbone design. Now, one branch of meat-eating dinosaurs took the... Uh, tailbones and limited their flexibility. They probably weren't as good at swimming, but they had a stiffer tail that could be more effective uh, for balance as the animal was running around on the land. And by swinging that tail back and forth, probably helped it maneuver and perform high speed turns and things like that. That group of dinosaurs is called the tetanuri, uh, which means stiff tails. And here's an example of one of those bones from one of the tetanurin dinosaurs. This is a bone from the rearmost third of the tail of an allosaurus. So here we don't have those transverse processes anymore, and we've got uh, the post, uh, sorry, the prezygopophyses protruding forward and the neural spine protruding backwards. And when these bones were all lined up, each one of those neural spines fits into this bracket in between the two prezygopophyses, and that makes the back third of the allosaurus tail stiff and identifies it as a tetanurin. So uh, that is one modification to the basic dinosaur tail design. Now in the four-footed, long-necked herbivorous dinosaurs, the sauropods, there was a trend that went in the exact opposite direction, not making the tail stiffer, but making it even more flexible. And a good example of that is uh, Brontosaurus, and another good example is Diplodocus. They belong to a group of dinosaurs that we could call the whip tail dinosaurs. And this is what their tailbones look like. So. Uh, Look, mom, no prezygopophyses, no postzygopophyses either. Uh, in fact, no uh, transverse process of neural spines either. This is a really stripped down, no frills vertebra, uh, nothing but a rod with nothing to impede its movement. Furthermore, in uh, most 
predatory dinosaur uh, tailbones, and most of the plant eaters too, for that matter, the tailbones are flat-ended like this, and that doesn't permit uh, as much flexibility as you might want if you're going to use the tail as a whip. If you're going to use the tail as a whip, you need a lot of flexibility, and the way to do that is to have each end of each tailbone uh, convex and then they're connected together with ball-on-ball -ball joints. These are connected together with, um, with metal, but in life, of course, there would have been ligaments attaching these in a string. And uh, when these were under attack by, say, an Allosaurus or a similar predator, they could use that tail like a gigantic bullwhip. There's 40 of these things lined up one after the other at the tip of the sauropod's tail. And getting hit by this thing, propelled by half a ton of muscle at the base of the dinosaur's hips, would have been no fun at all. Kind of like um, a cross between a titanic bullwhip and a 40-segment long set of nunchucks.